But America is fundamentally broken. America is fundamentally broken. And so much so to the extent that we no longer function in a manner which our Constitution mandates. Uh, when you have the, the disparity between the desire of the people and the actions of the government, when you have such a gap, something's broken. Something's broken. It's, it's fundamentally broken when the Supreme Court of the United States of America, who are there to uphold and defend the Constitution, Constitution is premised on individual civil liberties, gives those same civil liberties to corporations. We're broke when that happened. The second that happened, we we were fundamentally broke. Citizens United has gutted us as a nation. You know, I know some people are out there saying, oh, it's about free speech and you can't, you know. No, corporations have money and money controls everything. You must, I'm not talking about getting rid of speech. I'm talking about getting rid of the money, the money that corrupts everything it touches. So, but here's the problem. The, you can't talk about a revolution in America. That's unconstitutional. I mean, that's a violation of the law. Now, if we get to the point where a sufficient majority of Americans no longer care about the rule of law, then we'll have a revolution. And we're heading in that direction. When you have a fundamental breakdown of society uh, where people lose faith in that which they're supposed to believe in, you know, we, we could have problems. I hope we don't get there. But what has to happen is peace activists. Um, is when I say it has to happen, I mean, who am I to tell the peace community anything? You know, I'm just a guy. I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in peace activism. Um, but I, 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 I am, I do believe in winning. And I think the first thing I would say to the peace activists is that you need to start winning, which means maybe stop trying to go from zero to 60 right off the start and go from zero to five, you know, and, and, and get up there and get that first victory, then get the second victory and the third. You know, we're, we're talking about change, but you're not going to change everything overnight. We have to have small victories. And so you have to break the problem down into little you know, constituent parts that you can then focus on, you know, accomplish one mission at a time. The other thing is, if, if the people truly are opposed to a certain policy direction, stop trying to change the government, start changing the political parties. Now, there's a lot of people who talk about, oh, we need a third party. Good luck. People have tried it and they failed. That's one of those impossible dreams right now. I believe that the Democrats missed a golden opportunity in 2016 when the Democratic National Committee elevated Hillary Rodham Clinton as the nominee over Bernie Sanders, who clearly uh, was more popular. They, they cooked the books, they cooked the system, they, 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 they did everything they could to get her there. You know, the, the, the thing about a political party is it's, it's not an elected, they're not protected by, electoral law. they're not government. And so I think at that time, Bernie should have led a revolution, a, not a violent revolution, a peaceful revolution, but take over the convention and say, all you guys are fired. We've just fired you. Get out. Leave. We're in control now. We're picking the nominee. I'm the nominee. And that's it. You guys lost the faith of the people because you are corrupt, because you don't deal with the people. You deal with you know, political power elites, et cetera. The Republican Party, fortunately, the, the, the person they rallied around is Donald Trump. But, um, you know, they, 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 I think the same thing. We have to stop letting unelected institutions define democracy for us. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party do not have the, uh, uh, a, a constitutional mandate to, to define democracy for us, but they are. Because when you go to the ballot, ballot box, they're the ones picking the, the names on the ballot through a system that pretends to have our participation, but again, it doesn't. We have to take control of the, the, the nominating process for political position from the grassroots all the way to the top. Because right now we, we basically show up on election day and we're given a slate of candidates that we did not have a, a say in. The system had a say in it. The blob had a say in it. You know, it's, it's like cancer promoting, you know, saying vote for more cancer cells. No, we want to vote for the cells that eat the cancer. <laughs> but in order to do that, we're going to have to take over the parties. 
Uh, so I do think there's going to have to be nonviolent revolution at the local level. You know, seize control of your, your local parties, get people in. You know, the power of democracy works better grassroots than it does at the big level. So start at the grassroots and start getting the people in as your mayors, your town supervisors, and then work your way up to legislate. Take control of the House legislature then take control of the Senate, then get a governor in there and do that in 50 states. Now you have now you have a power base. And now you can start hitting that national stuff because that's the only way America is going to survive. And I want America to survive. I want the Constitution to survive. I want my country, you know, all that it has, all this great potential to survive, not just to survive. I want us to flourish. I want us to flourish, but we're not. What exists today would make our founding fathers sick to their stomachs. What exists today is so far removed from what we're supposed to have been that it's unrecognizable as the United States of America. And here's the final thing. If you're going to call yourself a peace activist, learn the Constitution, please. Learn the Constitution. Read it, know it, study it, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, because you can't sit here and say that you want to change America. America is the Constitution. It's nothing else but the Constitution. The Constitution defines who we are and what we are. And I know it's an imperfect document. But you know, in order to form a more perfect union, it means the founding fathers knew from the start, we weren't perfect. We needed to get more perfect. So we're coming together. You know, so the Constitution promotes the democratic values and ideals we're supposed to have. But we can't abide by the Constitution if we don't know the Constitution. I'm going to be just dead straight honest here. I can go to any peace activist group in America right now, shut the door, throw down a basic test on the Constitution, and I will bet you that 90% of them fail. And that might be a low number. <laughs> I mean, I don't have that much confidence in people to take the test. You know, the the, 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 the non-native-born Americans who have to take their citizenship test know the Constitution better than most Americans. So that, that's, that's where I would be. You, know, you just got to go to you know, first principles, basics. And the Constitution is the basic building block upon which everything else is, it can be constructed. And I know that, I, trust me, I know the peace movement is frustrated with America. And I know the peace movement's lost faith in America. But the America that they've lost faith with is not the America that we could be. So rather than try and create something totally new, which isn't America, by the way, it's got to come back to basic. Here's the thing. You're going to lose people like me the moment you say that we're going to proceed in a non-constitutional manner. Because as an American, I can't support that. I've given an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So I, I can't support anything. That is a deviation from the Constitution. Recognizing that the Constitution is an imperfect document, I could be in favor of amendments. We have a lot of them, by the way. We've amended this document over time. Most of those amendments are pretty good amendments, too. You know, women getting to vote, abolishing slavery, you know, things of this nature. So I that, that's where I come. But I I I I think that we have to we have to have reasonable expectations and we have to have solid foundation from which we're working. You know, I'm not here to promote Russia as the, 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 you know, the supreme anything. Russia is Russia, for better or worse. But I will say this. The Russians have uh, been able to take you know, a, a, a $68 billion equivalent defense budget and produce a military that can kick our butts. But we spend $800 plus billion a year. Why? Because most of the stuff we're spending this money on is superfluous. Just lunacy. I mean, how come Russia can build these nuclear weapons that outclass us in every way, shape, or form with a fraction of the budget? Why can they build a main battle tank that will outclass ours on the battlefield? Why do they, can they build all this artillery with all this ammunition? Why can they put 200,000 men in the field and then mobilize 300,000 without blinking? Their economy is still functioning. No problem. Because there's you know, and, 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 and they do this on top of what we now know is, I'm not going to call it rampant corruption, but there's corruption in the Russian system. You know, they, they have these governors and they have these military commissars who weren't doing their jobs, who uh, were supposed to put stuff into warehouses, but were selling it on the black market. Now the mobilization has come. The warehouses aren't full. Soldiers aren't getting what they want. You know, 
Russia has the problem. But despite all that, they're still doing fairly well. They produce hypersonic missiles. You don't. With what budget? A fraction. There's something wrong with the American way. We, we, we continually have to spend more money. Now, one of the reasons is because Congress has figured out that even though we don't call ourselves a socialist society, we're one of the biggest socialist economies in the world. Scott, how could you say that? I don't know. Because the government spending, the defense spending, $800 billion a year, is it, it, it's not that we need it for defense, but we need it for economic sustainability. The way the, the Congress has broken down defense spending, putting bases here, bases there. We're going to build an airplane, so we put a part here, a part there, a part here, a part there, a part here. Spread it out so everybody's getting money. Price of the plane goes up. We build weapons not because we need good weapons. We build weapons to keep the system going. The F-35 is one of the most expensive uh, fighters ever built, probably the most expensive fighter ever built. It doesn't work. I know they're going to say, oh, it works here, there, and everywhere. It doesn't work. You get shot out of the sky by the, the Russian Su-35, which is produced at a fraction of the cost. Uh, we could have upgraded the F-16. We could have upgraded the F-18 for you know a, a, just a little pittance, but we can't do that. Because it's not about building the weapons that we need to defend ourselves. If it was, we could have an army that was five times better than the one we have at half the cost. We could have a Marine Corps that would outperform the Marine Corps that exists today at a fraction of the cost. We waste money. We waste money over and over again because it's not about doing the right thing for the defense of the country. It's about bringing blood to the tumor. <laughs> You know, this defense industry conglomerate that's out there. And I don't know how you, how you, um, again, because all of our politicians come from the deep state blob, none of them are inclined to fix the problem uh, because they don't view it as a problem. They view it as the mechanism of empowerment. It's about how do you empower yourself for, for political uh, office? You do so by Becoming from the blob, therefore you are the blob. <laughs> there is no separation between the politicians we elect and this blob, so that we we spend money and money and money and we get nothing from it. Our army today is probably the weakest it's been in a long time. Uh, you know, we have a president out there, you know, claiming that we're going to stand up to Russia. With what, Mr. President? With what? We have an Air Force that hasn't really improved itself. They spend all their money on a fighter that doesn't work. God help us if we ever had to put the F-35 into action. Uh, whatever planes the Russians didn't shoot down would break, and, and then we'd be left with nothing. You know, but we, 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 we spend all this money. We get, and, and if you take a look at the U.S. budget, it's not just defense spending, but everything we spend money on. There's waste, 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 because it's not about you know, if we say we want to build bridges, <laughs> I tell you, our bridges are so expensive. We could, we should be able, if you gave Russia our bridge, but our infrastructure budget, man, they'd have high speed trains going up and down Russia the place and they'd have money left to go over in oligarch's pockets and go buy a yacht and go on vacation around the world because the Russians don't waste money like we waste money. You know, we keep mocking other nations and talking about corruption. Well, what we've done is mainstream corruption. So, you know, it's it's not it's not corrupt to do what we do because Congress writes the budget and it's done in accordance with the law, but it is as wasteful as it gets. And this way, we'll and then we back it up. Again, now we get out of my comfort zone. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm not an economics guy. So um, you know, anytime you get me talking money, just take a look at my checking account. And you'll understand you don't want me talking money. But the the fact is, you know, the dollar need the dollar is tied, you know, we took it off, the, my understanding is we took it off the gold standard uh, back in the, the you know, 60s or, or somewhere around there. And, um, and we attached it to the intrinsic value of the nation, the national economy. Okay, I get it. I understand that. We've got this big economy and, and, and we're going to make that have a valuation and we're going to link the dollar to that. And then we have the Fed that's doing money supply. Okay, still my simple marine brains catching on to this stuff. I get it. There's a cause effect relationship. The dollar has value, except it doesn't because we've decided that 
it does, it's as if I could, you know, I've been budgeting my entire life. And I finally said, stay the hell with it. I want a Porsche. I just print money. How much money do I need for the Porsche? Print money. Fine. The debt, he's a debt ceiling. And suddenly the dollar means nothing. Nothing. And then what makes it worse is the one thing that the dollar is attached to is the is petroleum, the petrodollar. But now, because we've alienated the world, that's going out too. So we have an economy right now that somebody needs to explain to me how it functions, why it functions, what it stands for, what it represents. So these numbers that we throw out there about the defense budget are meaningless because we can't sit there and get shocked about $800 billion when that money means nothing. It, it, it's it, it's not like you and I, you know, if I look at a $100 bill, I'm, I'm getting a cold sweat. So I'm like, oh my God, $100. How did this happen? Uh, but for the government, billionaire, billionaire, trillionaire, trillionaire, it's all fake to them. They, they do whatever they want uh, in order to keep the blob fed and to keep the power structures happy.